Hey guys, this is Avery with the Skips Tactical Solutions Podcast. I'm back with another great interview. And this week, the interview is going to be with Michael, also known as Mike. He is the owner of MJ's Firearms. And I'm so glad to have you with us today. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me, um, Skip. Uh, it was nice to meet you down at uh, the NRA show. Um, sorry, I missed you for you know C train event, but it's all good. I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me uh, so I can tell this story. Yes. So Mike is with us today, and we're going to learn a little bit about Mike. And he also has a really good story to share with us here in a few. But first, I want to get to know a little bit about Mike. And Mike, can you tell us a little bit about you and your background? Okay. Well, I started off working in the gun community when I was uh, just 18 years old. I was working for. Um, the first African-American manufacturer company. I was their first employee. Uh, I was working for them. Uh, my, my job description was uh, I was a gunsmith and an armor slash armor. Uh, I was an armor and a gunsmith for them. Uh, I did that for about four and a half years until uh, they uh, went out of business and I ended up getting, getting my own FFL license and I started my own uh, company, so which now is known as MJ's Firearms. And MJ right, stands so, for my <laughs> So he just dropped a huge nugget there. He is a FFL holder, and we're going to get into that a little bit here in a minute. But what kind of – so you said that you started working with this company and you're a gunsmith. Do you um, – have you had any other training as far as um, firearms related? Oh, as far as, like, just basic classes and things like that, as far as local in Illinois, that's it. I did not serve in the military. Uh, I just was a civilian and I, you know, graduated high school and I was, had a love for guns and was in college and had my son and <laughs> I needed to make money. So I didn't have to do something really fast and I went to a small uh, gunsmithing school and then I ended up, you know, getting certified and building, you know, guns and then got hired by a company and that's pretty much where, and then, you know, everything took off for me, you know, working in the gun industry, meeting a lot of people and then, you know, getting more familiar with firearms in general so did you grow up around guns i did yes uh my mother and my father uh owned guns uh i had a lot of family in law enforcement and military very deeply in my family some as far as fbi and you know local police and sheriff's department you name it i got a family that's been everything so guns have been a huge part of you know you know our lives ever since i was you know before i was born so okay so that's good because i know for me and some other people we didn't grow up around guns so once we left the house that's kind of when we got introduced to it so did growing up around it you obviously had a healthy respect for firearms and when you were able to be armed that's when you were like hey yeah this is something that i want to do full time and i want to be able to conceal carry myself yes like to really get in detail about that uh question you just asked me um when i mean grew up around guns my family owned a gun or two not oh, like okay. me now you know now I own bunch so and i carry every single day my family do conceal carry also but that kind of took after me when I got a concealed carry permit, they seen me getting into, you know, firearms as heavily as I did. Then they just went, they just up their, you know, <laughs> firearm game and, and you know, <laughs> training and all that good stuff. So, uh, but yes, I do, you know, ever since, you know, I was a young boy, when I, when I left and I moved out and I got on my own, I got really heavily into guns and I do carry every single day. If I can't carry, it's like a, feel weird <laughs> so i i got into guns heavily after i left my parents house okay so what do you carry uh i carry a glock 19 uh generation 5 it's actually right here okay no, there is a, nothing fancy i'm not really it's just a glock 19 it has the you know amir glow night sights on it and, uh surefire x300 light that's it that's all i need <laughs> You're like, oh, it's just a Glock 19 Gen 5. <laughs> yeah, <so> I, <laughs> yeah, that's it. 
<laughs> yeah, I got a light on it, you know, some night tights, no big deal. <laughs> man, you'd be surprised. A lot of people got these Gucci Glocks, man. They got all this Terran Tats and all this extra stuff. And basically, I don't need that. Just give me a Glock 19, some upgraded sights and a light so I can see what I'm aiming at. That's it. That's important. And obviously, MJ has been doing this for a while. Sorry, not MJ. Sorry, Michael has been doing this for a while. So he knows the importance of having night sights. So if you guys don't know the importance of having night sights, um, you don't know when you're going to encounter a threat. Not all threats will happen in the daytime. And you want to be able to have your night sights. Sure. Yep. All right. So when it comes to you, you said that you're at FFL now, so do you have an actual location? No, I'm just a home base. I have I haven't even had my FFL for not even a year. I've only had it for like seven, maybe seven or eight months. Not not long. Um, I'm in the process now. I will have a storefront really soon. I'm working towards that um, and a few other things. So that's coming next. So everybody be looking for that real soon. So so you're located in Illinois, right? Illinois, I'm outside of Chicago. A lot of people freak out about that. They're like, oh, you're in Chicago. How do you have a gun store in Chicago? I'm not in <laughs> Chicago. I'm okay. in Illinois. I'm in a suburb. I'm in Richmond Park. So, <laughs> All right. So if you're listening to this and you're anywhere close to that and you would like to support MJ's firearms, make sure that you hit them up, check it out, and support them because I know having an FFL is major. Everybody can't do it. Everybody's not built for it. but he is, I'm not going to call him young because then it's going to insinuate that I'm old, but you know, he <laughs> is younger and he's killing the game right now by having his FFL. And that's a goal that I want to achieve one day as well. So major props to you for having your FFL and that's awesome. So maybe I can reach out to you when I'm ready to get mine and you can help me out. <laughs> I got you. I got you. And you young too. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> young too. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, like, whatever you need, anybody, you know, especially you know, if you, anything you, I can help you with as far as you know, getting your fill and things like that. Um, it's just a phone call away. So, <laughs> all right, great. So, Michael <clears throat> recently had an event that happened with him. If you haven't heard about it, then it's something that I posted about on my page not too long ago because I really wanted to not only share who he is in his story of being a young African-American male and having a FFL. But I also want to share this story because it can happen to any of us. Um, we don't know when we will encounter a threat. We don't know when we will need to use our firearms for personal protection. And this is someone who, I mean, it's just a normal person. He's a dad, he's a son, he's a brother. And here it is he had to deploy his firearm. So, Michael, can you walk the audience through what happened? Okay, well, first off, uh, before, right, you know, I was going to my girlfriend's house um, and she lives actually in Chicago because she's a registered nurse at a hospital. So, as I arrived to her, her home, uh, where she was, where she lives. I had my five-year-old son, MJ, with me. Um, got out the car. I also had my buddy. Excuse me. I also have my buddy Devin. Uh, he um, does podcasts and things like that. I'm pretty sure you've seen him before. Devin. Devin was in the passenger seat. Uh, so it was three of us in the car. My son in the back seat. Uh, me being the driver and my friend Devin being a passenger. Uh, we arrived at the uh, house. Uh, when I when we got there, Devin stayed in the car. Me and my son got out. Um, we were walking the house. It's a it's a building in Chicago. There's a lot. There's all everything's really close. It's like everything's kissing each other. I don't know if you've ever been like New York City, or any major yeah. city. Everything's really really close, and everything, all the like the way the city is set up. You know, they don't put trash in the front of the house. They put trash in the back where they have alleys. So, and there's an entry level, I mean, there's an entry way to the house, to the actual house on in the alley. So you have to walk through the alley if you want to get in there pretty easily. So I'm walking through the alley. And as I'm walking through the alley, I hear a lot of noise. Uh, sounds like somebody's yelling. Um, I'm got a lot of lint and trash and drinks and stuff like that, and, you know, all in my hand and stuff, trash in my pocket. 
from, you know, driving on the road, you know, <laughs> snacks and stuff, you know. So I'm <laughs> going to throw away all this stuff out of my pockets and stuff I had in my hands uh, in the garbage can. Uh, the garbage can was actually uh, right across from the alley, but we're still in the alley. There's two sides, you know. I go to the trash can that's across from the alley because that's where all the trash cans are. As I'm at the trash can, I see an individual yelling, and he turns. Uh, it looks like he was over the phone yelling at somebody else, you know, you know, using a lot of, you know, bad language, you know. And as I'm sitting there looking at him and he's looking at me, he, you know, stares me down. He's look like, you know, you looking, excuse me, you looking at, you know, th- like, you know, saying a lot of cursor. My son's right there with me. My son's like not even two feet from me. Um, he's cursing and he's, you know, he's like, you know, what you looking at? I'll kill you. You know, I don't know if he mistake me as somebody else. I don't know where all that aggression came from, but uh, he starts to threaten me. He's like, I'll kill you, you know, and he put brandishes, he pulls out his gun, like from like this side, like this, pulls out a gun. When I seen the gun, I grabbed my son and put my son behind me and I kind of like pushed him a little bit on to the side where the other house is to where it was a brick wall. So it's a small, everything's very, very close, like very tight. So I push him by the other house where it's a brick wall right there. So it, it felt like he's a little bit more safer because when I seen the gun, I, I, at that point I went into what I have now. I have under, understand, now what I understand what happened was it's called tunnel vision. Some people get it, some people don't. I don't you know necessarily know all of that, but at that very moment, I went into tunnel vision. When I went into tunnel vision, <sighs> sorry, hold on, I just gotta. When I went into tunnel vision, everything's pretty fresh. So excuse me if I'm kind of, you know, taking some deep breaths because everything. No, you're still, fine. All right, and everything's still kind of a little stress, a little stress, you know, stressful for me right now. So when I when I went into this tunnel vision, and I felt like I pushed my son out of kind of, you know direct you know you know firing you know yeah out of harm's way yes but like he was like where where the where i he had his gun so when i pushed him out of harm's way and i i went to uh grab my gun he extends his gun when he extends his gun he at that point he started walking towards me when he started walking towards me i unholstered my gun as i unholster my gun he opened fires on me and my son. Well, my son's about now about three or four feet behind me, but he opened fires. When he opened fires, I didn't duck. I didn't, you know, go behind the wall. I jumped in front, you know, of those rounds, you know, and I returned fire and I sh- was shooting at him. And at this point, we're now in a gunfight. I can't really say too much, you know, about how many fire, how many rounds of, you know, fired. But at this point, we're in a gunfight. There's a lot of gunshots going off right now. Um, my main focus, you know, knowing that my son was right there behind me, uh, was just trying to stop him, was just trying to stop the throughout. When I seen him, a lot of people, when they get into a situation like that, even, you know, officers who I have talked to, a lot of them don't even really get a chance to see their sights. I actually was able to really, it's weird, but I was able to actually see, you know, him for a short period of time, you know, in my sights. And when I did, that's when I, you know, I was firing at him, um, and he went down. When he went down, I looked back and I grabbed my son because my son's standing there. He's looking at me like, "What's going on?" He's completely is. He was definitely traumatized. Um, I was very concerned for him. I uh, grabbed my son and I run back to the car as fast as I could, and I uh, put my son in the back of the truck. And my buddy Devin is like, you know, what's going on? He just heard a lot of gun, gunshots go off. He's like, what's going on? What's going on? I'm screaming. I'm yelling. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm trying to be calm. But at this point, yeah. I'm very, I'm very, my heart rate is up. I'm, you know, check my son. Make sure he's okay. You know, I'm, I just, yeah, I grabbed my son's shirt and ripped it and put my hand up his body. And I was just feeling, you know, if I can feel any holes or blood or anything like that or anything. That was abnormal, you know, for him. And he was fine. He was talking to me. Yeah, by the grace of God, he was not hit. Um, my buddy Devin uh, in the car um, actually, you know, covered him with blankets and things like that. And 
put them like you know underneath this like kind of push them down by the, like the lower part of the truck it was seats and things like that um and at that point i, re I reloaded uh my gun and then i went back and when i went back i was on the phone with the police uh the first thing i did was i told them you know who i was and uh what was happening what happened and i told them I, you know my name is michael wall you know i gave them you know my credentials and things like that and i told them uh, there was a shooting. I am the person who shot him. You know, the guy is down. Uh, can you, and I, I asked them, can they bring, you know, the ambulance, you know, a medical team, EMTs or anything like that here to help him? Because I know he, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's messed up as it sounds, you know, you get some people and they like, you know, they like, oh, well, I shot a guy. Oh, well, I don't care. You know, things like that. You know, at the same time, he's a human being, you know, I hate what he did. But, you know, and I, by the grace of God, I was able to stop him. Uh, but he's a human being, you know, and I believe everybody deserves a second chance, you know, and I'm like, you know, at the same time, I have a good heart. I feel like I want to give him, you know, some medical attention as soon as possible because I, at this point, I know there's not, there's not a threat. I still have my gun on me. My gun is still out. He's down. But I went up to him and I see that he's bleeding and he's – doesn't even look like he's responsive. I'm just trying to get him, you know, at this point, I'm just trying to get him as much medical attention, medical attention as possible. So I called for, um, at that point, I called, you know, and tell them, you know, can they get the um, EMTs here, you know, ambulance, and, you know, they're telling me, hey, do you have a tourniquet, anything, anything like that? I ran back to my truck, see if I had a tourniquet. I didn't have my, uh, my, medical, my medical bag on me. I left it at home um, before coming there. Um, and then I ran back to him, you know, to see if I can, you know, apply, I took off my shirt, see if I can, you know, apply some type of pressure to where, you know, I seen a gunshot. But at that point, you know, I, I didn't, you know, he was, he was, the way he was laying, I really couldn't see any gunshots. There was just a gunshot to his head. And then, uh, I thought I saw one in his shoulder in another place, but I was just trying to apply some type of pressure. Um, but at you know, when I noticed, really noticed that he wasn't responsible, I kind of stopped. I don't know if I was kind of like shaken up by seeing all that blood. I didn't really, you know, I was. It was. It was a really. It was. It was pretty. It was really tough, you know, experience. It was seeing somebody bleeding like that and smelling the smell of blood. And knowing what you just did, it's kind of tough. And you know, it was it's pretty it was a pretty hard situation to go through and to even be trying to put at this point to be trying to, you know, perform some type of medical attention on a guy like that. It's not easy. So, yeah. So what yeah. I wanna say is first, I really appreciate you sharing your story because you have a powerful story and you dropped a lot of things just in that short amount of time that I feel like a lot of people can learn from. So I know, you know, even recountering all of this in this conversation is hard for you, but I do appreciate you sharing your story with us. Um, one of the first things that I want to talk about is you had someone else with you. You had your child with you, right? Yeah. So uh, the, uh, it was really you know, tough. Five year old. So the first one, the first things that you wanted to do was to get him pretty much away from that threat as you know as far as you could you know so you said you got him behind you and kind of out of the way um because you were willing to put your life on the line to make sure that he was protected so that's awesome and then you know i want to go over the fact that you're so you were aware of your surroundings. You know, there's always indicators, right? Sometimes. So for you, the indicator seemed to be someone was having a lot, a loud conversation, right? And it was like it was, you know, pretty heated, and they were cursing. Mm -hmm. So that kind of put you on notice, like, hey, what's this going on? And then you you were aware because I mean, if you were not looking, if you were just, you know, not paying attention then he possibly could have pulled a gun on you and you wouldn't have even seen it and had time to react. So really good on you to be aware of your surroundings. And then next thing that I want, that was a lot of good nuggets. I'm like, well, I need to write this down, but I look, yeah, I was too into the sorry. story to be able to write it down. Yeah, I'm 
I'm sorry if, you know, because uh, whenever I speak, I try not to say um and things like that. But considering this is very fresh, this happened only not even two weeks ago, it being very fresh on my mind and me going through some it all coming back and replaying yeah. in my head, my speech and everything is kind of, it's, it's just a tough, you know. Oh, no, so don't. About, oh, excuse me. I hope you guys, uh, you know, all the audience can actually, you know, understand and, you know, comprehend what I was trying to you know, the message I was trying to, you know, get. No, so definitely we got the message um, and don't apologize for that. But I'm just saying like you dropped so many good nuggets and I wanted to write some of the stuff down because I wanted to kind of re-hit on these things. But the next thing that I wanted to re-hit on is natural reactions to a life-threatening encounter, right? So Mm -hmm. as concealed carry holders, we are basically saying that we're armed to deal with these life-threatening encounters, right? So if someone pulls a gun on you, it is a natural reaction to get tunnel vision. And when I teach my concealed carry classes, I have like a whole section of things in my class that I don't think a lot of other instructors even cover because it's not the fun stuff. It's not the sexy stuff, right? So talking about tunnel vision, right? Tunnel vision is very likely to happen because you're going to be focused in on this threat. And then the other thing is that auditory exclusion, because sometimes it's just you don't even know what else is going on around you. Like your son could have been crying. You may not have necessarily heard that because you now have auditory exclusion because you're just really focused in on this threat that's in front of you. So, I mean, if you're listening to this or you're watching this and you've never really thought about some of the natural reactions to a life-threatening encounter, having that tunnel vision is absolutely natural. And that's something that you may possibly um, encounter. And knowing the things that you may encounter is very important so that when they happen, you're not second guessing yourself or doubting yourself. And then the other thing I kind of wanted to go over was, you know, you got your son back to the vehicle to make sure that, oh no, actually something else I wanna encounter is your sights. Um, Being able to use a firearm in a life-threatening encounter, you may not necessarily have the time to line up your sights. Right. You know, time is of the essence. And I tell people this, like, it's like, you wanna beat them to the clock so that you can stop, so you can stop them so they don't harm you. And you were able to, get shots off and shots that were well placed to stop this threat but you may not necessarily have time to focus on getting your sights lined up because right. you know lining up your sights so you know you have that natural point of aim and if you've never practiced what that natural point of aim is i will recommend that everyone out there listening or watching try to practice that because it, time is of the essence and you may not have time to get those dots lined up or you know if you have an optic if you got a dot on your gun you know are you going to be able to have time to turn that dot on so that you can hit that threat you may not (laughs) you know so for people who run red dots or you know if a lot of people run dots so that's just something to think about as well yeah and to speak on that uh I'm, i'm i'm not i don't dislike red dots but me being now i feel like because I have lived through an experience like this, I have been a huge fan of just iron sights and things like that. I love red dots on uh like ARs and you know yeah. you know, that. But as far and I like them on handguns too. But as far as in my self defense gun, that's why I showed you guys my Glock 19. You know, I just you know just give me some upgraded sights and the light. You know, I'm good. Like I don't want you know. In that situation, I'm not going to have enough time. That's, you know, Skip, you know, you brought up a very, very valid point. I, you're not going to have enough time to stare and, oh, let me turn my light on. You know, I mean, hold on, you know, bad guy, while you're shooting at me and there's bullets flying past me and my son's head. Let me turn on my, you know, Trigicon, you know, red dot and, you know, put, a, you know, aim at him. No, you're not. You just get that gun. You know, the weird thing is, and I said that, it was kind of strange, but I actually did see my sights. I actually did see him in my sights. And, you know, I at that uh, event I went to, the NLC uh, Train and Learn event, I went to, you know, one of my instructors, uh, Ken, I don't know if you know Ken, um, he actually was, you know, drilling that in my head while I was there. He was like, hey, get that gun up 
in front of your face and then punch it out there. Get the sights and then guide your sights into the target. Don't punch the gun out there and then while you got the target out there, look through your sight trying to find the target in your sights. No, get the sights in front of you and then guide them into the target. And in this situation, I did feel like that really helped me and it potentially probably saved me and my son's life, so. And so MJ, sorry, not MJ, I don't know, because everybody else calls you MJ. Right, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> but Mike had just recently went to a training event and a lot of the training that he did, so what he was pretty much just telling us was the training that he had just went through, he was able to apply that training to the threatening encounter that he had just um, encountered. So if you do not train, I highly recommend that you get out and train and don't always train yes. with what may be fun to train with, right? So for me, I have to carry something smaller because I don't have a big frame. So I, of course, would like to use my Canic TP9, right? But that's not what I'm concealed carrying, right? Because that may be easier for me to shoot, right? Versus mm -hmm. my concealed carry gun that's going to be smaller. So you need to be very intimate with your concealed carry firearm. I call my concealed carry, that's my lifeline. Like, mm -hmm. that is what's going to be able to get me home to my children, my husband, whoever it may be. Right. But that is what you need to be very intimate with. So if you don't go out and train, I recommend that you train. And then another thing is, you know, Michael said how his heart rate was elevated and his heart rate was elevated and everything is just different during a stressful event. You know, your palms start to sweat, your heart yeah. rate's increasing, you know, you're breathing hard. And all of these are things that we talk about when you're shooting, you know, your grip, you know, your trigger pull, your breathing, your follow through, all of that. But when you're going through a stressful encounter, these are things that are not going to be standard as if you were on a regular range and your heart rate's not elevated. Yep. And another thing also, uh, you said a lot, yes. But another thing, you know, on the range, and, you know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, I can shoot, you know, this well and I got this type of group. It's a big difference. And it was a huge difference from coming from the event and these targets standing still. Yep. Then a target moving. Now imagine a target moving one. Now imagine a target shooting back at you with leap with deadly rounds. That's yep. and on top of that, you gotta either and if you're in my suit, my, my shoes at that point, you got a five year old your child right behind you that you also have to care for all at the same time. Now you're not gonna be able to shoot that really good group you were doing at the range. Yep. <laughs> it's not going to happen like that. You're going to miss because I did miss, but you just want to stay on target. You want to stay in the fight and training is such a huge part of carrying a gun. And if you don't, if you don't take the time to train and, you know, and I'm not saying, oh, you got to take Skip's training. I'm going to be taking her training class. But you don't hey. have to <laughs> go and get some training, even if it's what you can afford, even if it's local, because I did that also. If that's what you can afford and you can afford some local training, take it. Because if you don't have the proper training and you're carrying a gun, that gun can get you killed. And that's a fact. Um, and I don't think people realize how affordable training actually is. I think yeah. people have like this facade of if I'm going to take a course, it's going to be this much. And nine times out of 10, the amount that you pay for your gun, is going to be at least double of the amount of a class is going to be. So you paid all right. this money to get this firearm, right? And now you're not going to learn how to effectively deploy this firearm because now you're trying to say you don't have enough money for that. But what I will say, and I'll get off my soapbox on this one, People can afford what they want to afford. So yep. if you really want to go get some yeah. training, right? But for me, um, Skip likes to get her nails done. Skip likes to get her lashes done. I like to do all that, right? But what I will say is if I feel like I can't afford something, something's going to have to go. And when it comes to self-protection, I'd rather have my eyelashes not done. I'd rather have my nails not done and be able to know that I can properly defend myself and or my children whenever I need to. So just know um, you 
can afford whatever you want to afford. If it's putting five bucks to the side a week or 10 bucks to the side a week, it'll all add up. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's, that's what's most important. I mean, that's also for men because we see these things and I see people and, you know, you're like, oh, well, sometimes training this, you know, it's training this. People don't understand how, how training is really affordable compared to them buying this really, this, this other gun. It's only, you know, it's probably two times cheaper, please. I know people who spend thousands of dollars on guns, these Gucci Glocks, and they have, they spent no, no money on training. They go buy, they go, they go invest like $1,500, two grand into a handgun or even a rifle or buy a bunch of guns, but they have no training behind these guns. Like it's, that's the part that kills me. I like, you know, I think training now is like, it's, it's very important. I can't stress to you guys uh, how important it really is, you know, and it's your responsibility. I mean, it's, it's, it's your responsibility to be prepared, you know, and I'm going to leave it at that. Hopefully, you know, they have the, you know, the proper training that, you know, in, Hopefully they don't go through this type of situation yeah. because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't wish this for anybody. You know, I don't wish this for myself. I wish I would have never even been yeah. there. I wish we could have just, you know, took another detour. Maybe I could have came an hour later and never even met, you know, had that encounter with that uh, young man. So it's just, just be prepared, and, you guys. And, and like you're saying, you know, the importance of training. So, Mike has obviously been through this traumatic event and he is a huge, he was already an advocate for training, but now furthermore, he is more of an advocate for training. But yes. this is why we train. We train right. for these events, right? We train to be able to stop a threat. And if you're not training to stop these threats, like he said before, the firearm that you're using can be possibly used against you. You can read someone and see if they are not comfortable. Right. If someone is not comfortable and they're going to hesitate, the gun can possibly use against you. So if you're going to let someone one get close enough to you or two, um, if they get that close, maybe they can use that firearm against you or two. It's just they're going to just get that close and then now they're going to harm you. So um, definitely invest in some training. Uh, if you are hesitant about training, you have questions about training, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can reach out to me or you can reach out. Um, I'm sure Mike will be open to fill some qu questions too, but we definitely sure. want to make sure that you get training. If you have not taken any training in 2019, I'd like for you to make a goal right now to take some sort of training in 2019. That's right. You can just keep building upon that. I'm not saying you got to go take a class every month, but you should be getting some sort of range time in at least once a month and try to get some training. And sometimes you'll just make friends, right? Yeah. You'll make friends and you'll have fun, and you're just going to learn something yeah. that you have never learned. And I can promise you, every single class that you go to, you will pick up at least one nugget from that instructor. Regardless of how long you've been teaching or how long you've been shooting, you can learn something from everyone, male, female, whatever it may be. That's right, yep. Black, white, purple, gray. <laughs> you can learn. You can. So, um... Another thing is first aid, right? So first you wanted to get your son to safety, make sure that he was good, um, checked him out, he was good, called, and then they wanted you to apply first aid to him. And it's not funny that you say that, but you know, today I posted about tourniquets. If you don't have a tourniquet, um, if you have a range bag, try to have something like that in your range bag because the possibility of something like that happening um, is very likely where you're gonna need to apply a tourniquet but you actually attempted to perform where you were going to perform first aid on him. And like you said, that was something that was extremely hard because this person was just trying to harm you. And that's awesome that you actually went back and you, Oh, and then I want to cover that you reloaded. Yeah, if you I only have one mag with you or you don't have any additional rounds with you, I will tell you that the possibility of you needing an additional mag to reload is highly likely. And I covered that in my class too. Your first shot, you will possibly miss because you got all this adrenaline, you know, your heart rate. And if you are carrying something and you don't have a lot of rounds, 
I mean, what if it was two people, you know? So you need to make sure that you have the adequate amount of rounds, right? And I'm not gonna say you'll know that, oh, you only need seven. You don't know how many you'll need, but I can promise you, you'll probably need a spare mag because if once you're done with your first mag, that one thread is down, what if another threat happens and you don't have any rounds to be able to save yourself? That's right, absolutely. Um, and I agree with you 100%. Um, I had, not only did I have spare rounds, the police actually took three guns from me. I had I had another gun inside the truck in our arms reach. Um, I, had, um, I, had, I had, yeah, two of them uh, guns inside the truck. And they're both of them, and, you know, one's in the bag, one's in the arm reach, and I had mine that I had, you know, my EDC that I had appendix carry on me. I had it right in front of me. Um, and in that situation, even after firing those rounds, you know, if you have, if you're carrying a gun, and you don't have an extra magazine, I don't, you know, good luck, because you never know how many shots, and I can shot one time. You know, I can't really, I'm not gonna speak about how many rounds of fire, but I can only shot one time, and he could have been down, but you never know, like you said, you don't know if you're gonna need six, seven, or 15, or 30, whatever. You don't know, you know, so just, again, it's your responsibility to be prepared. So. I recommend now after me, go, you know, living through this type of event, I recommend carrying an extra magazine. I'm going to be carrying five personally, <laughs> but I definitely recommend carrying an extra magazine. So definitely, you know, if I can tell you guys anything, you know, carry an extra magazine. If you can carry an extra firearm, you don't necessarily need two, three guns on you like John, like your John Wick or anybody like that. But, Carry an extra magazine, you know, carry a knife, something else, you know, that you can possibly defend yourself with. And this is something, this is going all the way back kind of to the beginning, but this is something that I want you to share because I encounter a lot of students that are very hesitant on carrying with the round in the chamber. Did you already have a round in the chamber? Yes. Good question. Skip, you, you, you own it. You got a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you, you're really good. <laughs> yes, I did have a round in the chamber. I did. So I want to talk about the importance of carrying with a round in the chamber. Carrying with a round in the chamber is, and I kind of equate this in a class when I'm talking to people and I try to break it down to them is, do you put on your seatbelt right before you get into an accident? Or do you just put your seatbelt on when you get in the vehicle because you don't know when <laughs> it's going to happen, right? Right, yes. I. That's, I, I mean, that's exactly how I feel. Like, you know, like you just said, it's like if you get in an accident, you're going to put your seatbelt right up. No, like carrying around, having around, not having your gun not loaded, especially EC, this is your everyday carry gun. If you don't have it loaded and it's not ready to go, like I'm, need, I'm, me, I'm not even, I'm not a safety type of guy. I, you know, the type of gun I had, it was a striker fire handgun and did not have a safety. I, I'm not a, a huge fan of safeties, but it's all about training also because you can train you i know people who can unholster a gun and you know hit the safety and still be able to you know stop somebody but still i recommend carrying a loaded carrying a gun loaded having one uh the chamber you know ha having that magazine you know, you know all the way fully loaded with you know really good defensive rounds because if you you know this is that's what you guys got that's like you know like skip said that's that's your lifeline that's my life that's what's gonna keep me alive. That's what's gonna keep my family alive. That's what's gonna keep my friends alive and other people, you know, around me. You know, so I recommend definitely keeping around, you know, in the chamber at all times if you're gonna be carrying the gun. Yes. Um, so MJ, sorry, Mike encountered this person and this person was shooting at him, right? So he didn't necessarily have the time to pull his firearm out of the holster, put around in the chamber and then line up and be able to shoot this person. So I think that's very important. And you might not listen to me, but I would love for you to listen to Mike and know that you need to carry with a round in the chamber because I always say the seconds matter. And this is a matter of seconds where you cannot take it back. You can't go, okay, well, next time. So possibly you could be harmed, possibly killed. So carry with a round in the chamber because external safety or not, there's still seconds that you have to take away. So 
train, carry, and just be prepared for those days that I hope you never encounter. But if you do, you're going to be prepared for them. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree with you 100% again, Skip. Um, you got to gotta, gotta be prepared. And you got to, you know, seconds, they matter. You know, milliseconds matter, you know, yeah. in that type of situation. Everything happened very, very fast. Like, you know, when I went into tunnel vision, everything slowed down. But literally right after that, everything happened very, very fast. Yep. So you're not going to have enough time, you know. So, um, well, let's, let's hope you do. But you probably more than likely you're not going to have enough time to actually load your gun or, you know, put a magazine in and, you know, you know, you know, rack the slide and get the But gun. if people have that amount of time, like maybe then they could just avoid the whole threat, you know? Right. Normally these things are happening like super quick. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's common sense. That's good. You know, if you have that much time, you've probably got enough time to actually walk away or run away, or, you know, and that should be, you know, you know, you don't want to have to fight. You don't have to shoot somebody. So, you know, you don't want to have that mindset, I'm going to stay and fight and shoot somebody. No. You know, in that situation, in, you know, that happened with me, it was, everything was instant. You know, when I pulled that gun out, he had his gun loaded. He fired at me first. I didn't see him cock his gun or anything like that. He, he opened fire on me. Well, that I can remember. Maybe he did. I don't, you know, but at the same time. We it just happened so quick. Like, there wasn't a lot of, there was no extra time. <laughs> no extra time. Thank you. And, uh. So this is something else that I want to talk about. I, we're not going to be on here much longer, but I want to talk about, okay, so you, you've been prepared for this, right? You've trained, right? You encountered the threat. Now I want to talk about the aftermath. This is the part that I call the unsexy part, right? Uh, right. Mike has already talked about a couple of the things that I cover in my class, which is your firearm is evidence now, right? So if you only have one firearm, then possibly now you may not have any. So if you have a spouse or if you have um, the funds to be able to have more than one firearm, I would recommend having more than one because if you use your EDC, your everyday carry, mm -hmm. in a defensive manner, it's probably going to get taken away from you because that's going to be evidence. So that's something that you need to be aware of. And then another thing is the emotional part of it. In my class, I call the emotional, I have emotional, social, and legal. These are the things that people do not talk about. That is not the sexy part of it, you know? That's not the shooting part of it, you know? It's now the aftermath of it. The aftermath mm -hmm. is very real, and that's one of the first things that I thought about when I thought of Mike, because, okay, he's went through a life-threatening encounter, and there could be a lot of things that he's dealing with. Some people are not good with social, right? So if this person's name's being blasted all over social media, right, that may not be something that they're okay with dealing with. Um, the emotional part of it, there could be a ton of things that he's dealing with. There could be the um, elation, right? Elation is he's excited that he was able to stop the threat, right? That could be self-doubt. Oh my God, what did I do? Um, should I have shot him, right? Or there could also be a slew of other things that he could go through right now that isn't the first thing that people think of when they think about a defensive shooting, right? People don't think about that. They think about this person shot this person. So what I want to ask you is, and if you don't want to talk about it, feel free to say that you don't want to talk about it, but is there any sort of that aftermath that you're dealing with? Um, yes, um, uh, in a way, uh, everything kind of hit me right away, like, m not moments after the shooting when I got into the police car, and I, I'm a man, I, I'm not afraid to say, you know, I did break down, you know, because I seen him, I walked up to him a few times, and I seen, seeing a dead body, you know, or a person that's hurt, I can't say he's really dead, but seeing somebody non-responsive and, you know, a lot yeah. of blood, a lot to take in. And I wasn't necessarily, you know, breaking down just because of that situation. Yes, it was. It did have some, some, you know, it had a little, a played a part. But my son, you know, you know, I, in my mind, I did check him, but I don't know if he's really okay. Maybe it was something I missed, you know. 
I'm crying like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking down. Like, you know, is my son okay? It's the first thing I ask, go check my son, go check my son. As I'm in the back of the squad car, you know, in handcuffs, because you are going to be put in handcuffs regardless, even if you're a good guy. You know, and that was my first time being in handcuffs. They were tight as hell. I mean, tight, very tight, excuse me. Uh, they were, the handcuffs were very tight. And I didn't, you know, I'm like in this really uncomfortable situation. I'm trying to figure out what's, you know, what, what what's going to happen next. And in my head, you know, knowing when I see my son and me breaking down, me being, you know, all stressed out in this situation, you know, after the shooting, seeing my son kind of made, made, made me calm down because when I seen he was okay and they told me he was okay, I was able to, you know, get, you know, collect myself and get myself back together, you know, knowing my son was okay, you know, and knowing I did what I did, you know, to, you know, to protect him made me feel a whole lot better. So now, like, days after the shooting, um, I don't really feel like I'm not, you know, having any nightmares by the grace of God. I'm not, you know, dealing with anything really mentally because I know I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a believer uh, in Jesus Christ. I know what I did was right at that moment. Taking a life is never right. I b believe that also in a way. But in this situation, you know, protecting my son and protecting myself, it was the right thing. And I know what I did. No. Was, I and right. I mean, so what you're talking about right now, is like that self-reinforcement, which is very important because you know that you did right by you and your son. And that self-reinforcement is going to help you be able to deal with the situation. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. You're kind of like, I'm kind of like stumbling for words right now. Like, hey, I can't really, I've got a lot on my mind. I'm still everything fresh. Yes. No and that's important. That. Actually, yes. That That is why I can live and I can go about my, you know, daily routine you know, in my daily life. Because knowing that you did the right thing makes things a whole lot easier for you. Yep. So do the right thing. You know, when you carry a gun, if you have the mindset, I just want to kill someone. I just want to do that. Or I don't, you know, if that guy looks at me wrong, I'm just going to shoot him. If you have that mindset, put that gun down and don't carry it, please. Because, you know, you're, you're going to make us look bad as responsible gun owners. You know, me, myself, and Skip, and everybody else, you're going to make us look bad, you know, if, you know, you actually have to use that gun. It's, you know, the police investigators end up discovering something else. So don't, you know, be, be a responsible gun owner, carry the gun the right way, and use the gun only in a situation where you really feel like you have to. I would have never thought in a million years that I had to use my gun. I just loved them, and I love shooting them. I love building them, and it was a sport to me because I played sports growing up. I love running. I love fitness. I love, you know, actually running out there with the gun, and, you know, that's, why I, that's another reason why I got so big into training after because I use it as, like, a fitness thing, you know. I like running outside and hiding hot weather and, you know, shooting, you know, targets and moving, and, you know, that's something I like doing now. So. And I, I'm just really honored that I'm able to talk to you. And although I've never been through a traumatic event, a defensive shooting, I pray that I never have to go through one, but I'm glad that I'm able to learn kind of firsthand from you because I teach people this and I'm teaching based off of what I think they need to know, right? But all of these things that we're talking about is kind of like validation that I am going over the right things with my students because no, I have not been through a life-threatening encounter, right? But I still feel like I know the basics of what they need to know in order to defend themselves. And the last thing that I wanna go over that you mentioned is, so that other person didn't really have their side, they couldn't tell their side of the story, right? Like, and I don't necessarily want them to be able to tell their side of the story. I don't want them to be super coherent to be like, I want to stop this threat as much as I need to stop it, right? I'm not trying to blow out a kneecap. I'm not trying to do any of that, right? But when the cops came, how long did it take them to get there? Uh, they came pretty quick in Chicago, um, in high crime areas they have um, these huge sensors on the top of the, uh, like the, the light signals. And you probably know about this in the military. I've heard you guys use these things too. Uh, anytime there's a gunshot that goes off, it sends signals to that 
I don't know what you want to call it, a monitor or whatever. Yeah. And they come to that exact location of where those shots were fired. So I know people are like, whoa, you should be able to stop a lot of crimes in Chicago then. Yeah. But in this situation, they did they did come pretty fast. You know, two or three minutes they were there. And That's good. You know, they, they 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 were they were heading that direction before I even called them because of, you know, you know, the Chicago Police Department actually having those, you know, those models. So then on that, something that I want to cover is so the police are responding, right? Whether you are calling them or, you know, someone else calls the police, just know that there, there's a possibility that you will be a suspect, right? You could be a suspect, you could be a witness, whatever it may be, but there is a possibility. So what I tell people is when you're dealing with police officers, you need to remain respectful you need to make Absolutely. sure that you're being coherent. Like if you're acting a donkey, then they're probably going to treat you like one. Right. So yeah. when you're dealing with them, just know, I mean, you may be a suspect. Like he said, he was put in handcuffs, right? They right. need to investigate. They need to see what's going on. And mm -hmm. all they know is what that initial phone call told them, but they were already on the way probably once he, um, once he called them. So that's something that you guys need to know as well. You may be treated like you're a suspect. That's, and I tell people in my class, I'm okay with being a suspect, right? I'm alive to be a suspect. And then I'm going to tell my side of the story. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. And if I can give any, uh, I, I agree with you, Skip, 100%. Um, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being a suspect. I was a suspect. I was put in handcuffs. They have a job to do. As police officers, they have a tough job. They don't know who you are. You know, I told them who I was, yes, but and I gave them a, a description of me as I was on the phone. I think people, you know, this, I, I want people to really, you know, listen to me when I'm you know, saying this right now. When you give people, you know, the description about you, when you, a shooting happens, let them know who you are, you know. Let them know that you are the person who did this. Let them know that you are, the, you know, you know what you have on, you know, typically, like, you know, something. Just give them a description about you. I recommend after the threat, which I this in this situation that happened after the threat was down, before the cops came there, I did take my gun off me after I knew that after I saw there was not another threat. I did take my gun off me. I did unload it and I did put it away. When I when the police officers came up, I did show them I had my hands up. I did not have a gun on me when they arrived, and I recommend everybody do the same because you don't know. And I don't like to throw race in there, but me being African American male, and you know that can be a tough situation. You know me being especially young. You know they don't know who I am. They don't know, and in that area, that's who's you know being young. You know. African American male, that's the environment I was in. You know, they don't know. You know, that's everybody kind of looks the same. They don't know. So try your best to stand out in a different way. You know, try not to be, don't try not to look like a threat. You know, like you say, don't handle, you know, the officer when they come up there. I didn't say, you know, what you arrested me for, low law, or, you know, give a mouth. No, you know, I, you know, I had my hands up. I told him, you know, how you doing, sir? My name is Mike Walla. I am the person who called. Hands up. They were very, you know, when they came up to me, they didn't push me to the ground. They didn't kick me. They didn't put their boot in my, you know, neck or nothing. They, okay. They put me in handcuffs. They said, okay, turn around. <laughs> put your hands on back, you know. Yes, you know, and I told them, yes, sir, I completely, you know, fired with them. I wasn't, you know, being, um, resi you know, I wasn't resisting arrest or anything like that. I just, you know, did what they asked. I let them do their job, and I'm going to tell my side of the story. Like Skip said, you know, and I'm not going to be a, you know, gonna, I'm okay being, you know, talking about, you know, <laughs> just don't, I just don't want to, I just don't want to be shot by the police. So. And I think that's important that, you know, you said you let them know who you were, um, mm -hmm. your license concealed carry holder, yeah. and also what you're wearing. Because if, what if someone else called and they're like, okay, so there's shooting in this alley, two black men, right? how do they know which black male is the one that's standing there now? It could be the one who was actually the threat. So you need to be very cognizant of that and identify who you are, what you're wearing, and just know that they're, they're coming and they don't know, like they're responding to a crime. They're on high alert and he identified himself. He didn't have his, and don't, 
don't have them show up and you got, you got your gun out pointing it at people. Like, unless there's yeah. still an active threat, but you just need to make sure that you let people know who you are. You need to let people know um, what role you're playing and what you look like. Because he said there's a lot of young African-Americans there that may typically be committing the crime. So if they're coming and he's a young African-American male, then they know, okay, this male, he identified himself as the one who stopped the threat, but we still have to do our side of the job. All right. So is there anything that you would share that you would do different? Something that um, the people who are either watching or listening can learn from? Um, I was really proud of myself. I thought that I did a lot of things right. The police officer said the same. They thought I did everything very good. Uh, carry extra magazines, <laughs> possibly. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, that's only thing I could think. Carry extra magazines. I'm the type of person, like, you know, I'm the nine millimeter guy, you know, uh, have as much ammunition, have as much ammunition as possible, afraid to run out of ammo, you know, things like that. So I'm just, you know, if I can carry extra magazines, I would. That's probably the only thing I'd change. So I have to say, I am so proud of you. I know I met you, I think it was a couple months ago at the NRA annual meeting. We didn't really get to talk much, but I did get to meet you and then to hear that you went through this and you were able to come out and tell your side of the story. You did things the right way. And from what I hear, like, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't have done it any better myself. And you did all the things that you were supposed to do to be able to come out and safe and have your son safe as well. The first thing that I did think about though, when I heard it is I reached, I didn't immediately reach out because I know he probably had a lot going on. I waited a couple of days and I reached out I and, I, and I recommended that if he hasn't already seek counseling, that he should probably get counseling and then he should probably put his son in counseling as well. I'm a huge advocate of counseling. Counseling can um, give you that reinforcement. Like you said, um, counseling can just help you get it out. And it always feels better to get it out because if you don't get it out, it's just going to keep building up and then it's going to explode and possibly it's going to explode at the absolutely Worst wrong time. moment <laughs> <laughs> or on the wrong person. <laughs> right. You could be at the grocery store and the person's like, what? Like, I ain't even do nothing. And it's like, because everything else has been building up. But um, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Uh, if you have not heard about his story, I will definitely leave the link to the article below. But, I mean, you just heard it straight from his mouth. So, Michael, where can people find you at if they want to connect with you after today? Uh, you can find me on Facebook at MJ's Firearms LLC. Uh, my Instagram page, uh, MJ's Firearms 33. Uh, my website is MJ's Firearms.com. You can find me on any of those social media websites. And any questions you guys have, I'll gladly to answer them. So anything I can do to help so I can, you know, potentially, you know, help another person so they can live through a, if they have to go through a situation that I went through, they can be able to, you know, live and be able to tell their story. So any help. I can be to people, I, you know, I'm definitely willing to, you know, help somebody out. So, and with me and my platforms, I definitely made it my mission to, you know, as a minority female, I want to put more positive images of minorities out into the world. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of negative ones, and yeah. I feel like this is just another positive image that we can get out there. So, if you have not heard about his story or if you come across the story, I would love it if you would share it with someone else. Someone can always learn from someone else's story. And I would love for you to either comment on the video below or comment on the podcast and send MJ some words of encouragement or just reach out to him on social media and send him some words of encouragement because I'm pretty sure he is going to need it. But we really appreciate you guys listening to the story. And MJ, one last time, where can they? hear from you from uh, uh mj's firearms on facebook mj's firearms llc uh mj's firearms 33 on instagram and my website mj's firearms.com so. all right guys so all his links will be listed below and thanks for checking us out